so I have uh, probably about 40 minutes of material today. We'll leave some time for discussion. Uh, I'm going to talk about a program uh, that started um, out of the Kerwin Institute. Uh, I had you know, been around in the uh, conceptual days of, of getting the program up and running. I had since left um, and then came back to do two evaluations of the program itself. Um, this is a program that is a local initiative, uh, primarily out of the south side of Columbus. Um, and uh, it's known as I Am My Brother's Keeper. It's actually gone through a few uh, names uh, during its, its uh, iterations uh, that it's existed. Um, it's been around now for, I believe, going on uh, since uh, 2014. So we're, we're almost up to four years of programming at this point. Um, and to uh, just acknowledge some of the folks who are uh, really the backbone behind this. Um, first, I want to say Franklin County Jobs and Family Services, who is the, um, <clears throat> the program wouldn't exist if not for leadership at the county in particular, uh, but also they've been the primary funder uh, for the initiative for the last few years, as well as the two anchor organizations, um, Kerwin Institute, my former uh, employer, um, and the Columbus Urban League, who are the two anchors. Uh, that basically anchor the program uh, itself. Um, so what is I Am My Brother's Keeper? Uh, very quick snapshot. Um, this is what I refer to as an intense support program. It is um, focused on boys of color in particular. And since 2014, um, that number's a little outdated, probably served 140 plus kids. Uh, during this time period. Um, serves boys ages 8 to 17. Um, this is very deliberate because um, when you scan a lot of youth development uh, resources that are out there, um, what you find is that um, there's a big void, particularly for youth um, coming out of elementary school into the kind of those um, early teenage years. And um, actually this is a very fundamentally important time, particularly when you work uh, with youth uh, who are facing a, a lot of challenges. Um, you can end up kind of losing a lot of kids during this time period um, to um, kind of issues from the streets, more or less, uh, to be uh, quite candid. And so um, this is kind of the cohort that we focus on uh, in particular. Um, as I mentioned, we do exclusively focus on kids from the south side of Columbus. Um, but I'll note, um, with the population we work with and the massive mobility, uh, housing instability that we see with our population, our kids move around a lot. Sometimes they're on the south side, sometimes they're not, um, which creates some transportation headaches for us, but um, yeah, it, it, it is what it is. So uh, one thing here I want to point it toward me. Um, so in terms of the approach itself, and this is where I want to talk a little bit about the inception of the program. Um, I had this rare opportunity back a few years ago uh, when Anthony Trotman, who has now left us to be county executive down in uh, Charlotte, uh, North Carolina. Uh, Anthony Trotman was the former uh, executive director of Franklin County Jobs and Family Services. Um, he, if you all remember, during the Obama administration, there had been a lot of discussion about this notion of, of a national initiative called My Brother's Keeper. A lot of foundations had met regarding this. There was some White House guidance that came out. Uh, but Anthony uh, came to uh, the Institute uh, in the summer, basically, of uh, early summer of 2014, and said, uh, you know, I'm, I'm fed up with all this talk about my brother's keeper and very little action. I just want to do something. So, um, you know, look at the best practices that are out there. Um, I want to work with the most challenged boys in particular and give me an idea, give me a proposal, and, and maybe we'll pilot it, uh, which is an awesome and exciting thing to hear from a policymaker. Um, the, the not so exciting part of this is he said, well, because of the, um, <clears throat> the schedule of how our budget looks right now, you have to come up with this in a month, um, which is a little, little more daunting. Um, but that's, that's how it works sometimes. And so what we did in, in talking to him is that we kind of pulled from some best practices. We also then wanted to kind of latch onto um, 
some of the critiques of uh, programming, particularly youth development uh, programming here in Columbus and community development programming. Uh, critique number one is that there's, uh, for the most part, even though we know it's very important to link more traditional community development with youth development, it doesn't happen as much as it should. Those often are, are kind of very siloed worlds. Um, two, when we talk about um, any type of programming in Columbus, and many of you have probably heard this again and again, um, there's a, a, a kind of a saying that came out of the Franklin County Infant Mortality Task Force about Columbus being a program-rich, system-poor environment, right? And, and in the youth development space, this is also, uh, I think, a good description. We have lots of programs, um, but very few programmatic options that really are holistic and encompassing or aligned. Um, and so, again, this is one of the things that we had hoped to do would kind of to answer this particular challenge as well. And then in terms of model practices, um, we took a trauma-informed approach, which I'll talk more about in a second. Um, we focused on a, a two-gen approach, right? So we work, with fam we work with youth and their families, and often their extended families. Um, and we looked at both asset-based models of development and collective impact models um, as really kind of thinking about this notion of how do we leverage existing resources that do exist because we are a program rich community right so how do we how do we build a program that leverages off of these other programs um, so going back to the trauma-informed piece um, why this is so fundamentally important is that um, you know for most programming in, in general that's focused on extremely marginalized groups or groups who have dealt with a variety of kind of um, intensive um, challenges. One of the things that we tend to underestimate is the role of trauma, right? And so when talking about trauma, what I'm really talking about um, is a, an aspect of what I call chronic stress. So if you looked in this side of my graph here, this would be chronic stress. Um, prolonged, unpredictable, severe stress, often from multiple perspectives, right? And what we know from that is that, at least not only psychologically, but physiologically, um, that is uh, terribly damaging in terms of individuals who are under chronic stress, particularly for youth. And then building up upon that kind of concept of chronic stress, we also know that trauma, which is uh, what I would refer to as a kind of a nuclear stress incident, and this is a stress incident that completely overwhelms your uh, physiological response system. Um, trauma is also particularly damaging long term, um, both in terms of impacting adults, but particularly trauma that impacts children, right? So, any, really anyone in their prime kind of developmental years, between zero to 18, late teens, early 20s. And so um, what we know about this is that uh, studies have been very clear in pointing out to us that the more childhood trauma that youth deal with, um, the more long-term damage happens in terms of their ability to control emotions, um, you know, really in, in the context of uh, impacting their decision-making processes, um, dealing with issues like rage, really symptomatically what we're talking about is post-traumatic stress disorder, right? And, and also symptomatically, you're seeing many of the same symptoms in a lot of youth who are in very challenging environments than you would see uh, experienced by returning veterans from combat. Symptomatically, they're gonna act very similar from that perspective. Um, so when we talk about youth, there is an ACE score, uh, which is a 10 point test, um, which measures adverse childhood experiences, and then um, uses that to kind of gauge susceptibility or vulnerability to some of these different issues. Um, what they also know is that, retrospectively, studies have illustrated that the more ACEs that folks accumulate during their childhood experiences, the predictable um, aspect of future life outcomes look pretty grim. Um, so just this is a quick example here. Um, <clears throat> people who have six or more ACEs uh, in childhood have a life expectancy that's about 20 years less than people who have none. Um, you, know, you also see very high rates of 
risk of substance abuse, cardiovascular disease, et cetera, et cetera. And when I say higher rates, really we're talking about, you know, if you have four or five ACEs, your risk in some of these disease factors goes up by a risk factor of about 500%, right? So very, very extreme uh, in terms of that. <coughs> also then in thinking about stress issues and thinking about trauma issues, um, and this is more pulling from the world of public health, um, one of the things that we have failed to really appreciate is both the life course or um, life history aspect of chronic stress and how chronic stressors accumulate in terms of their impact over time. Um, and this comes from what's known as the life course perspective out of the field of public health. Um, and then what's emerging out of epigenetics, which talks about historical uh, multi-generational impacts of trauma. And while we're just starting to understand the influence of this, um, what I'm suggesting to you is that we've really underappreciated the role of trauma, uh, particularly at a community scale, where you're gonna see more of these folks dealing with many of these different issues uh, in one space, uh, more of accumulation of these different stressors in, in that space, and then also at the same time, more likelihood that you're dealing with some intergenerational issues, right? Because of the history of those communities. So my work more recently um, has been looking at this notion of uh, trauma at a community scale. And uh, in philosophically, what we'll talk about here in terms of what kind of informed this program is trauma informs community development, which does just that. So what does that mean, thinking about trauma at a community scale? Obviously, you're looking at kind of some of those individual factors, but you're also looking at a community from a, a very, almost the 30,000 foot level, and thinking about many of the different kind of community level trauma issues um, that you may be dealing with, and the more of these challenges that you have existing and coexisting in one community or one space would lead you to believe that you're in a community where you have uh, very intense amounts or degrees of trauma. Therefore, you may want to consider these trauma-informed practices in terms of how you may approach um, some of your work. So trauma-informed community development actually came out of the West Coast, um, came out of the San Francisco Bay Area, where public health and community development practitioners began kind of coordinating with each other uh, to think differently about how they were both serving communities and really addressing many of these issues that I've been talking about so far. Um, and, and really presenting a model that was intended to address some of the common complaints that come out of working with highly traumatized populations or communities, right? So lack of trust, um, lack of stability, reliability, um, feeling of disempowerment within that community. Um, just dealing with the situation programmatically, if you're delivering one program, you're dealing with a household that has maybe 12 other programmatic needs that you're trying to, to juggle and balance, which can overwhelm you. Um, and also I think which is a, a critical part of this is in some ways um, an absence of hope, right? Because um, at least psychologically what we see in many of these circumstances are folks who are, they're so attuned to living in the moment um, because of the fact that they're in survival mode, um, it, it can be very difficult to feel like you have hope in terms of what's going to happen within your own life or the fate of your community. It's this lack of agency in particular uh, for individuals um, that can be very uh, disempowering. In particular, they've got studies that show when kids feel, in particular, they feel more optimistic, they actually have hope. Um, their life perspective is radically different and their outcomes are generally very different from that perspective. So, what is it? So some common principles of um, trauma-informed community development is this notion of, you know, when you're working with these communities, um, you, what I would refer to this as stepping lightly, right? Recognizing that what you don't want to do is do more harm than good. And it's very easy to do more harm than good because folks are in very, uh, sensitive and sometimes perilous positions, as well as the likelihood that you may be coming in and triggering some kind of past trauma issue um, in the context of that community. It's a practice of radical acceptance, right? So this is this notion of if you are coming from the public sector or nonprofit, 
um, or any other kind of entity serving that community that you are meeting people where they are. You are not imposing your norms upon them. You're trying to adjust the way that you do work, the way that you do business to meet the needs of that community. Um, maybe that means our traditional ways of recruiting for a program we throw out the window, right? Because this community is radically different. Or the way we might do public engagement needs to be thrown out the window because this community needs to be engaged in a radically different way. Um, it, it's taking that time to really kind of reflect upon some of those issues. And that's why they also talked about trauma-informed community development as a very reflective process, right? You're learning kind of what works best in the moment um, programmatically. And then finally, uh, what I add here is an essence of really trying to empower the community, You're trying to build agency for folks uh, so that they feel more empowered in terms of their own life as well as the future of the community that they're living within. Um, what I also want to emphasize here is that in addition to kind of these principles, you're also thinking very concretely about how do you de-escalate the stress in the community. Right, so that means what are the most intense stress points that you can work with them programmatically or from a policy perspective. Um, in many cases, that's things like housing, um, maybe that's uh, issues of safety, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that you are working actively at a policy level as well as programmatically to address those things as well. Um, but some of that intel really comes from working with the community and understanding um, what those chronic stressors are. I would also then uh, suggest that when you're doing trauma-informed community development, it's very critical here that you're practicing uh, what I would refer to as cultural humility. Uh, and again, um, something that comes out of public health uh, for the most part, um, which is uh, in essence kind of going beyond notions of cultural competency and really kind of reorienting the way you engage with community um, so that you are, uh, again, kind of in, in essence, you know, being humble, right? But not humble in the sense that I don't know anything or, or I'm disempowering myself, but humble from the perspective that you, you are actually in a relationship with the community and you're, you have a willingness to learn, um, even when it means learning maybe things that you're doing or not working um, in that perspective. So um, the other aspect of this that I really want to talk about just in terms of foundational elements is that we, as I said, we pulled from asset-based development models, which really kind of focus on um, leveraging existing community assets to look for um, kind of very pragmatic community development solutions. And so many of the things I'll talk about programmatically that we did, we were leveraging those different assets. Um, also then this collective impact approach where we're trying to align ourselves with other activities as much as possible. And in the spirit of that, there's a reason why the South Side was picked. Um, the South Side was picked because it was also experiencing other um, redevelopment efforts at this time, right? Things that we weren't necessarily doing, but from a more holistic picture, um, you know, maybe we could fill a gap with some of our youth programming, um, and these other initiatives would also help address some of the more structural challenges that are going on, right? So, um, if you look at the South Side in particular, we have two very intensive focal areas of uh, redevelopment right now. Um, the Southside Renaissance area, which basically is an area known as the Southern Gateway. It's where the Reeves Center is, if any of you have been down there. Um, and then the Healthy uh, Homes area, which is the Healthy Neighborhoods, Healthy Families Initiative of Children's Hospital, um, which now actually stretches down a little south of Whittier. Um, and so we're, we're doing this programmatic work, but we're doing it in the context of other stakeholders actively working in the community. So we're trying to um, basically, in community development lingo, um, we're trying to get that synergy from our activities basically aligning with what others are doing. Um, so what is My Brother's Keeper? As I said, this is a very kind of intensive, holistic program. Um, what we do uh, from a very pragmatic perspective is that our staff are working with youth um, basically every Saturday for almost the entire day, um, as well as um, some activities midweek. Um, and then also on top of that, um, doing family engagement during the week as well, meeting with families, often one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and then in addition to that, 
working with the youth and families in, in, in an advocacy role, right? So, um, and I'll explain a little more of what that means, but um, almost if you can, can, can consider us legal aid, non-legal non, uh, non legal aid, right? How can we go in and advocate for youth and families as they deal with different systems um, that they're working with? So a little context on our kids. Um, you know, some of the dirty secrets about Columbus that we, we often don't hear reported enough is the fact that we have growing poverty here, right? So um, we have growing poverty, and um, we have poverty rates now that are higher than ever what's been, you know, anything that's been recorded in Columbus. And also then if you look at kind of populations that are in poverty or on the edge of poverty, that population is growing as well, right? And so what I'm showing you here is a graph of um, the 200% poverty rate. And the two bars here, this is 2000, this is 2014, and this is for the city of Columbus. Those are the poverty rates, right? If we look at kids who are officially in poverty and on the edge of poverty, that's the rate and the change in the rate between 2000 and 2014 for kids in particular uh, by race. Um, I think the most jarring thing that jumps out of that is that when you look at the African American and Latino population in particular, um, we're talking almost four out of five kids in the city now are either in poverty or on the edge of poverty. Um, and that that number has grown very substantially uh, since 2000, uh, which in some ways should not be too surprising given what we know about the kind of disparate impacts of the recession. Yeah. Uh, I just have a clarification. So what do you mean by under 200%? Yeah, so um, this is, uh, if you look at the official poverty rate, which is 100%, um, the 200% rate would be taking that income and doubling it. Um, now, programmatically, for example, temporary assistance for needy families, um, most programs use a 200% rate um, because the poverty rate is, is so low, um, given they haven't really changed the calculation since the 60s. And so um, what you'd be looking at then is that for, um, you know, a family of two, say a single parent with a kid, you know, the 200% rate would be about $24,000 in income, roughly. Um, but a lot of food assistance programs run at the 200% rate. Um, TANF, in particular, is at the 200% rate. So, um, let me say, when you're working with uh, social service agencies in particular, this is the population they need to think about because this is the population that's eligible for their programs. At least, currently, they're eligible. Um, so we'll just bounce back to some of our youth and the perspective of youth in our program. Um, the average uh, household income for kids in our program is about $14,000 a year. Um, that is basically about a three-person household. And so most of our kids are, are well under the rate from that perspective. Um, and. Uh, Many of our youth in particular deal economically, at least with a lot of um, very profound issues just in terms of housing stability, uh, costs for transportation, costs for health care, costs for food, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the other thing I, I want to preface here, and, uh, particularly when we talk about um, this program or, or trauma-informed programs, there is a, a direct connection and linkage often to issues around violence, right? Because Community level violence um, is, is one of the you know, most strong, stronger correlates to what a lot of folks kind of um, fear most in their community um, in terms of a, a trauma factor. And so um, what you're looking at here, this is the last, um, I think I pulled this data, last data ended maybe in December. Um, these are the homicide clusters in Columbus for the last year. Um, our program is right here on the south side. Um, something that we did not really anticipate in the context of our program um, was the degree and extent of how violence shaped um, circumstances, outlook, uh, and impacted the life of a lot of our boys. Um, because in many ways, when you break this data down further, for example, if I was going to show you youth, you know, folks who are under the age of 18 who are maybe shot or killed, um, you'd see similar clusters. Um, in the case of the South Side, many of those would be African American boys, not much older than boys in our program. And this is just a, um, 
one of the many kind of homicide memorials um, that we have throughout the Southside uh, community. Um, and what I, I want to present to you in a way is that these memorials um, are important from several perspectives. What they also do is they, they build almost an artificial geography for boys in our program about wh what's safe and what isn't safe and where they can move about the community. Um, and so when you see something like this, you know, I, this is blocks from my house where I live. Um, you know, I see this very differently than the 13 year olds in my community see this, right? And um, this is a marker of somebody crossed a line and was gunned down, therefore I need to be safer in terms of what streets and what blocks I can move around in the context of this community. Um, and so what it says is that our youth are, are very attuned to kind of issues of violence in that community and they feel that very deeply. Um, so it's a major trauma issue. Uh, violence issues in particular got so bad, and this is really what kind of broached our relationship with the Urban League, because uh, the Urban League runs um, community violence prevention efforts, is that we had to actually model, um, or use the model of violence interruption, uh, which comes out of uh, the ceasefire initiative in Chicago, um, and had to use that in many cases to de-escalate violent incidences uh, with our program, with youth within our program, um, and you know, what you, a way of kind of thinking about this is that in the context of a lot of the violence on the south side, um, it is uh, very relational, right? and it's also uh, something that's, um, you know, in, in the essence of like they say in ceasefire, it acts in many ways like a disease, right? It's contagious and it spreads, and, and so um, this is from a violence interruption that we did in 2016, um, where a small kind of pushing, kind of shoving fight between two boys in our program, which had been recorded and put up on social media, then escalated so that their friends were suddenly um, kind of having conflict with each other, these larger groups. And then it escalated more, and their siblings and extended family began getting into this conflict. Um, and then next thing we know, we had families, we had you know, the older people within the household and the families threatening other families, right? And then somebody shoots at somebody. Um, and that's about the time that we did the violent, uh, violence interruption. Um, and you know, again, this incident kind of de-escalated from that point on. A little bit more about what the substance of that is um, in the Q&A. But again, it's a critical, if you're working, if you're doing a trauma-informed approach, odds are you're probably going to deal with the violence issues and you really want to look at that literature on uh, from the field of public health on thinking about how violence acts as a disease and how you can intervene uh, in that situation. So a couple of things just to note in terms of trauma. Um, this is just a very short list of the most common uh, trauma issues that many of the youth in our program deal with. Um, I showed you the ACEs scores earlier. Uh, what I can say is for kids in our program, they're on the extreme high end of the ACE scale, probably more like an eight or a nine, uh, very common. Um, so what do we actually do? And I mentioned some family advocacy. That includes basically going into uh, public systems in particular and advocating on behalf of youth in that context. Um, that could be school systems, that could be dealing with other kind of county programs, um, that could also mean intervening in the context of a landlord-tenant issue for someone who's inappropriately being evicted. Um, and so kind of acting in that role to help with these families. Um, so a common thing that we deal with here is um, what I would refer to as uh, over-punishing in the school system. Uh, so a lot of our boys, uh, if they have minor discipline incidents, they get punished very intensely. Um, so we had an incident recently where um, somebody threw a pencil. This was a straight-A student, one of our older boys, and he was suspended for two weeks. Okay? And you know, our folks had to come in and argue down that suspension to a day. Right? But you have these very reactionary discipline policies that get put in place, uh, particularly in a lot of urban schools, 
And so our kids get over-disciplined, they are then missing too much school, and that, that cycle that happens in, in the context of that. Also, we have a lot of folks who have IEPs. A lot of our kids have special needs, um, and those IEPs often are not being followed in the school system, and so we do advocacy from that perspective. Um, a lot of coaching and mentoring work, obviously. Um, as I mentioned, kind of violence interruption activities, a lot of participatory community activities. So how can we work with youth to kind of talk about how they could improve their community uh, from that perspective? So we'll do kind of community-based programs. Um, through our Saturday engagements in particular, doing a, a, a lot of activities uh, in which we're creating kind of a space where, um, at, at least in terms of how some of our staff describe it, where kids who are never allowed to act like their children can actually act like their children, right? Because these are kids who are, uh, many of our boys are the oldest male in their household. And um, just because of some of the social norms within that household, they take on more responsibility. Or if they're out in the street in the neighborhood, they can't act like a kid, right? You have to act tough, because if you don't act tough, you're gonna get walked all over. You're gonna get victimized. Um, so what we try to do is really kind of create a space where they can actually be kids. Right, they can put down a lot of the defense systems that they've developed in the neighborhood and in the community. And then finally, last piece here is we do a lot of programming that's experiential. Um, where we try to leverage a lot of assets that are in the community and, and elsewhere in Columbus um, to really just give them experiences uh, that they're never going to get otherwise, um, that a lot of really poor kids never experience. Um, so, you know, just to look at some of our activities here, um, this is our fishing program, Metro Parks, um, a lot of music, uh, experience, music and arts are a big part of the experiential activities uh, that we'll do with them. Um, this is one of our tutoring. We have kids who just basically sign up because um, they want help in terms of their tutoring work uh, or homework and, and school activities during the week. Um, Bikes for All People, where they learn a lot of small business and some kind of early engineering skills at a co-op bike shop. Uh, also OSU campus, right? So none of our boys, even though they live a few miles from Ohio State, had never stepped foot on this campus, many of which never felt like they ever would step foot on this campus. Uh, it was a very foreign environment to them. And so we have been taking them to a lot of college campuses to basically normalize that experience for them. Um, and then again, also from that asset-based perspective, connecting these kids to different programmatic activities that they're never going to get the potential or get, have the access to from that perspective. So I'm going to give you two sets of evaluation outcomes. Um, the first here is from the first evaluation of the pilot program, so I'll review these real quickly. Uh, for the most part, what we experience in terms of our cohort of kids um, most experience improvements in terms of academics. Um, most also experienced a decline in disciplinary issues. Uh, we had very strong kind of parental feedback in terms of parents' perceptions of how the kids are doing, um, and some increased uh, measures of socio-emotional health as well. Yeah. Sorry, I had a clarifying question. How were kids selected into this program? Well, so let me get into that oh, in just sorry. a second. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, and it, it raises a conflict with doing programming and then trying to evaluate programming uh, because you intuitively end up with selection bias from that perspective. Um, but very good point. I'll jump into that. So the pilot went well enough that the county uh, extended the program, presented more funding. Urban League kind of came in as a secondary partner. Um, at this time, um, and so we launched um, kind of the second iteration of the program, uh, which just was evaluated back in December. Um, a couple of programmatic changes here. Uh, one, more connectivity programmatically to a lot of the other programs that the Urban League, Columbus Urban League runs. Um, everything from helping families improve their credit scores to job training to summer youth employment stuff. Um, the second piece, which is, I think, really exciting, is that we started, uh, and this is Tyrese here with Senator Brown, we started what was known as a Junior Shepherds program. And these, we ran into this obstacle that we had kids that were aging out of our traditional programming. But we had forged incredibly strong relationships with these kids. 
So we're trying to figure out, you know, what's the best way to do this? So we basically turn them into youth leaders. That's the, at least the goal of the program, um, which then they're, they're still part of My Brother's Keeper and they still participate very actively, but they participate in a very different way. And they also then do a lot of modeling and mentoring for younger kids uh, in the program itself. Um, so you had asked about selection issues. And um, so this is where it gets challenging in terms of doing the evaluation because obviously we're not doing an experimental project here, right? So this is, there is no control group, et cetera, et cetera. In addition to that then in trying to do recruitment, you know, we have a goal of trying to recruit our program as quickly as possible. Um, and you, know, you have to be fairly aggressive to be able to do that very quickly, right? And so, um, generally speaking, what we first did to recruit was we went to a lot of other um, programmatic stakeholders in the Southside community. And we just kind of talked about our program and said, which of our kids are you most worried about? Or which of your kids are you most worried about and think could benefit from this? Right? And so that, that began kind of the referrals of different kids who uh, could come into our program. Uh, there are some kids who get kicked out of other programs and, and they'll get kind of shepherded to us um, because we're seen as a little more welcoming to kids with more kind of extreme challenges, particularly behavioral issues. Um, and then what happened later on is that we started getting a lot of family referrals, right? So um, you know, this family's been in the program for two years and they have two sets of cousins that are now coming to the program. Um, and so that's, it, it's been fairly organic from that perspective. For evaluation purposes, um, the only way we could kind of evaluate this group against another cohort um, really was to look at families that we engaged early who dropped out of the program. And so we developed a cohort group that we compared to. Obviously, this is a biased cohort group, right? Because they dropped out for a reason. Um, but it's the best comparison group that we can focus on. Um, because I, wanted, I also want to acknowledge here that we're working with kids who have intense levels of trauma, some of the poorest households in Franklin County. All of our kids go to Columbus City Schools that are rated F, right? And so we're by nature dealing with some of the most vulnerable kids in the community. So we can't just compare them to your average child in Franklin County, right? And so again, we're, we're using this cohort as a, as a comparison. Um, so what we can say is that when we compare kids who stayed engaged with our program versus those families that dropped out, um, we saw uh, definite improvements. Um, this is the, just our active uh, group, and this is looking at the Learning Circles database uh, that um, City of Columbus Schools is involved with, with. and so um, Learning Circles puts kids into five different categories. And what we did see is that most of our kids early on um, were, um, this is kind of 2016 versus 2017, most of our kids were in the bottom two categories. Um, the kids that we engaged with, they basically kind of shifted over, right? Now these kids aren't straight A students for the most part, right? But we saw very, very you know, positive improvement uh, during that time period. And then in looking at comparison of, um, this is a core academics index from Learning Circles uh, for Columbus City School students. Um, we did see again kind of improvement in terms of uh, core academics. Uh, we saw for the kids who didn't participate in the program, um, relatively uh, unchanged, went down very slightly. Um, very significant change in terms of discipline uh, issues, and I'm cautious using the word significant there, but very substantial change in terms of disciplinary outcomes. And we saw this in our pilot program as well. Kids who are in our program just had fewer discipline incidents overall. Um, some of that I think is really from doing a lot of the socio-emotional uh, learning activities that we did um, in that context. But then also hearing from families. And so uh, in terms of this evaluation, um, we surveyed, interviewed um, almost all of the families in the program. Um, just a little word cloud here from their perspective of the, how the program basically impacts um, their son. Um, but more concretely, you know, talking about kind of how exactly does it impact them? Is it 
You know, is it necessarily self-confidence? Is it behavior? Is it grades? Um, in terms of grades, we saw you know some improvement, but wasn't our, kind of our strongest indicator in terms of improvement overall for the youth. Um, where we really saw a substantial difference is this improved self-image, self-worth, and then also um, improved uh, optimism for kids in the program. Um, and just some uh, different stories here uh, doing a thematic analysis of interviews with family members in terms of um, how the program has impacted their kids. And you know, again, these are just some of the major themes with some very uh, illustrative quotes of those themes underneath there, but helping them build social skills, um, providing them peer mentors um, that look like them that are successful, as well as exposing them. We have a diverse staff as well, exposing them to different folks um, who are unlike them and, and having them have positive relationships with those individuals, uh, which is, is very telling. You know, as one of our kids said early on when the program started uh, to one of our white uh, female um, staff, and this is, you gotta love what eight-year-olds will say, he said, look, don't take this personal, because I'm not racist, but I don't like white people. And she kind of helped, I said, let's unpack that a little bit. And he said, look, I, I just don't trust you, because the only white people I know are police and teachers. And teachers yell at me all day, and the police come and take away my family. So, you know, I mean, it, it is, it, you know, we have to kind of factor in how these kids have experienced um, folks within systems, uh, public policy systems in particular, or, or program service delivery systems, um, and how that impacts them. And then, uh, last couple of points here in terms of, um, you know, the, really the outcomes that we see are based on the relationship building that our staff have was able to, to do. Um, you, you see that really come through very strongly in terms of um, a lot of the interviews with family members um, and members of families and youth, but also then with the staff themselves in terms of, um, as one person noted here, um, you know, you build a rapport that gets you through the door, right? And the stronger that relationship gets, the more impact that you can have on that family from that perspective. So a couple of implications, my last slide here, just to close out. Um, so the program works. It's certainly, it's certainly expanding opportunity for these kids, and many of these kids are kind of on track, or at least were on track, um, to face a lot of very intense uh, life challenges. Uh, it's expensive. That's been the biggest criticism from our funder. I think we spend about $5,000 per kid per year which from a funder's perspective is a lot of money. Um, the reason it's expensive is because that direct one-on-one -on -one relationship building stuff, that takes time. And you gotta have people to do that, right? And you can't just count on volunteers to do that. And that takes resources uh, from that perspective. Um, the other thing that we found is that while this, the collective impact model where we're trying to leverage other programs has been very helpful, it's actually also extremely <laughs> difficult uh, because in this space, we really don't have a concrete backbone organization that is helping push this model necessarily. And so, um, particularly serving this population, you're engaging with a lot of other organizations and you're all pulling your resources from the same set of funders. And it's hyper-competitive. And so that hyper-competitivity, uh, excuse me, the competitiveness between organizations um, and this notion that organizations are just going to help each other because their missions align is, in reality, just doesn't happen very often. Um, and so you do need resources to engage each other if you're going to kind of get that synergy between uh, different programs. Uh, the last point here is that, you know, you look at the literature around um, African American boys in particular, you know, we know African American boys face a lot of uh, different aspects of bias um, and discrimination. Um, I will say that after evaluating the experience of working with these kids since 2014, um, we saw that uh, in, in all different aspects of the systems who work with our youth. Um, everywhere from the schools, to the police department, um, to some of the social service agencies and social workers that they dealt with. Um, 
again, it was a, it was a situation that's kind of why we had to do so much advocacy. It's because our boys are treated very differently. Um, and there are some racial bias issues that come into play here in terms of why they're treated so differently. Um, so I think we have like 10 minutes left for questions. So I'll, I'll um, stop for now, but happy to answer any questions. Yeah. Is there something like this for girls as well? There isn't, um, which has been, a, I think, a pretty valid critique. Um, there is a program called Rise Sister Rise, uh, which has been in Columbus for some time, but it's not well funded. And so we have talked about, um, we've had discussions with the county about kind of developing a program for girls, but understanding that the, maybe it's fundamentally different in some ways and how we would approach it and that there would have to be some kind of participatory development with those families to figure out what that would look like. Yeah, good question. Yeah, hey. Hi. Do you see from funders uh, any kind of perspective on, well, you guys are all doing the similar things, but you're just, just doing small, small thing here and small thing yeah. in some way, in, in somewhere else. Do you see any perspective or criticism from funders? Well, why can't you just organize and then yeah. you know, look at the upper in the stream? Yeah. Uh, Do funders actually ask for this? Yes, yeah. Well, no, th no, there's an expectation there that you will align as best you can. Um, it, ju it just takes time. It takes the, the, the time it takes to align with different organizations and build the relationships with different organizations, we found is, is a real impediment. And you have to factor that in as a cost. And so, you know, it, from, program, from a programmatic standpoint, we have basically a little over 30 different programs that we've engaged with some way, just with our program. But you can just magnify that, the number of meetings we have to have, and then the conflict comes up, and then the question of resources, yeah. And so again, you know, I think from a big picture funder perspective, whether it's philanthropy or the public sector, we have to think concretely about what incentives can we put in place to actually make that, that collective action actually happen. Uh, yeah, it's a great question. I think I saw there and there, yeah. So I'd be interested in how this program could be adapted in a world setting. Yeah. Where you have kids, some kids not doing so well, dealing with some stressors, but you don't have yeah. concentration of problems. Yeah. There may be one school. Right. And you don't have so many community supports. Yeah, resources aren't there. But then there's also some pluses in which Kids, yeah, families. yeah, absolutely. So I'm just curious how this might work in different types of So I think, I it, thought about that yeah, now. no, I have. I, I think it could work. Um, I think logistically, um, you're, I would say from a budgetary perspective, your transportation issues would be tremendous, as well as, you know, what, what we really leaned on was kind of, you know, we have this whole web of different places that we can engage with you're probably looking at more of a central hub where you're gonna do a lot of youth programming out of and then to think concretely what the right space is. Maybe it's the school, maybe it isn't. Um, and then also an appreciation that the, the relational family, the, the family dynamic may be very different in that rural setting. And so, um, you know, just trying to think about how recruiting, for example, may be a different perspective. Um, maybe the institutions you're engaging with or maybe it's, you know, you're going through faith-based entities instead of social service providers because there's not that many providers down there. Um, but I do think it, there, there could be utility uh, in that context. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, good question. <laughs> so um, we're basically at this point, I think about, we get about either a quarter or six months of funding at a time. Uh, from the county, so we're not very sustainable at the moment. Um, and that's just me being very open and honest with you. Uh, we have looked at other funders. Um, we've heard things like, you know, we well, have to bring down your per child cost. Um, and so that's where a lot of work so far has been trying to figure out how to streamline it. Um, we've also looked at, you know, are there other organizations that could come in and fulfill the role? Um, it, it's a bit of a challenge. You know, we were optimistic that again, like a second round of evaluations, which showed progress, would, would help us on the funding front. Um, and it has helped a little, but you know, there's just a lot of competing interests right now. 
and you know any program if you're reliant on one single funder like we have for some time that's you know, you're, you're going to be in trouble uh, from that perspective and so we're trying to be creative at this point and you know definitely urban leagues leadership has helped in a way because they have a lot of infrastructure support um, and what I would add too is that you know the in kind both from the two from the two different anchors has been extensive and so you'll probably see a lot more of that happening in the long term but um, we've built very strong relationships with these families and thinking about how to keep that going even if funding disappears that's kind of conceptually also a conversation that's happening at this time Yeah, the program itself. Um, we don't have a system set up right now to do that. But that's ideally where we want to go. Our oldest kids right now are about 17, um, so it's getting close to that time period. Um, there's also this notion that we would kind of track them into other programmatic you know, opportunities that are out there, whether it's thinking about some kind of higher ed or if it's vocational training. Um, but yeah, as, as of this time, we don't have the tracking, but I, I hope in a few years we can go back and look at the cohort long term. Yeah. Did you see like peer group changes? Like if they're together on a Saturday, yeah. maybe from different schools or from the same school, did they start hanging out with other yes. people? Uh, or did they maybe take some of the messages you were giving them back to their original group of friends? So what we, we kind of had a different outcome, which we, thought may happen, but it actually happened very quickly. Um, what happened then is, is that this cohort of kids began to hang out together. Okay. And so um, I think it was, was beneficial from the perspective of reinforcing each other. Um, where we do see conflicting messages come into play is often from family. Okay. And so like the violence incident that I mentioned earlier, you know, particular older men in the family were very, um, problematic in that situation escalating because they're like how did you let them disrespect us and that kind of stuff and so um, that's where we see kind of a value clash kind of happen sometimes it's, it's certain things that kind of play. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, other questions yeah what's the what's currently the yeah, so um, we were supposed to just be the evaluators. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, and so what happened was the, the original entity that we had um, partnered with to do a lot of the programmatic stuff basically fell through. And so we ended up having early on to supply most of, to, to do most of the one-on-one um, -on -one work. And so we ended up hiring a number of students. Um, we worked with a lot of social work students as well. Um, and then actually ended up hiring staff to, to do some of that role. What has been beneficial now that we have the Urban League in place, the Urban League has a more full-time professional staff. And so we still have staff we've hired and some students that we lean on. Um, but in the first 18 months, we were 90% of those individuals were coming from OSU, which was not sustainable in the long term. But um, it, it, if we hadn't done that, we probably, the program would have failed early on. Just because we, we lost that partner that we were doing. Yeah. Yeah. So, what do you think? When kids and their families sign up for the program, it's all voluntary. Yeah. Okay. So, what would you say keeps them, the kids coming back? I think it's the. Some of them have fun. To be honest, they, they, you know, it's doing things that they don't ever get to do, right? So, everything from summer camp to coming to OSU, coming to OSU once a month is such a big incentive for these kids. They were first very scared of it, but then it became this really, just, they felt like it was a really cool experience. Um, the other piece of that is the relationships, like both with their, their cohort, um, but also then um, with a lot of the staff. Um, the, the last piece of that, that um, we have very high participation rates. We didn't the first month. And what we learned was, and this is part of our cost issue, we pick each kid up every morning. And um, we're knocking on doors saying, hey, it's time to come to programming. 
and they're up and they, they want to be there. But we found if we don't do that, we're not enough kid. There's not that. There's not necessarily that person in the house to wake them up, get them out, and get them to program. And so we've kind of come and done that part as well. To the extent of we've had staff, the parents are like, just go get them out of bed. <laughs> take the program. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I, I think that is a big part of why we keep coming back. Any questions? All right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.